And let me encourage you to open your Bibles to Psalm chapter 40. The 40th Psalm. I've entitled our message this morning, Life After the Pit. Life After the Pit. And here's why. In this Psalm, David, this shepherd boy who became really, I believe, the greatest king who ever lived, tells us that he was brought up out of or delivered from one of life's pits. And while a very real physical pit was a thing in David's time, in this psalm he's really using the pit as kind of a description of a challenging or a difficult time. A trial in life, as you will, if you will. So it's something all of us can relate to in one form or another. And so in that context, David gives really some great insight into what life after the pit can and I would say should look like for you and I as followers of Jesus Christ. So let me pray for our time in the Word together and we will jump into this song this morning. Well, Father God, you know the hearts of your people. You know what their lives look like. And I believe all of us at some point in life have experienced what David is referring to as a pit of life, a difficult season in life. And Lord, I believe you've got something to say to each one of us through your word this morning. So I pray that you would use even me to accomplish that, Lord, that you would speak your word here into the hearts and lives of your people who have gathered here. Lord, they're dedicated. They're here this morning. They want to hear from you. So I pray that they would. They not only hear, Lord, but they would really intently listen to what you're saying to them to the point where they take it and they apply it to their lives. They use it in a very real and practical way. I pray that nobody who's come into this place this morning would leave here unchanged by the power of your word and your Holy Spirit to proclaim it. It's in Jesus' name that I pray. Amen. 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 So I, I know this guy. He was one of my best friends in my college life. Andreas was the picture of health. He was an intramural powerlifting champion. He was a prize-winning bodybuilder at that time. Uh, my wife to this day doesn't say his name without the word handsome being attached to it. And he was a handsome German guy. He earned his master's degree in criminal justice and he went to work for the United States government as a federal agent. He was a marshal. But after taking some shrapnel in his knee and one of his eyes literally being ripped out of the socket, my friend was medically retired, and in that time, he developed a very unhealthy addiction to pain meds. In addition to his physical injuries, he suffers through seasons of anxiety and depression that cause him to isolate. I've known him not to leave his home for a couple of months at a time. And I would say that during those times, my friend Andreas finds himself in a pit. I recently had the privilege of helping with a graveside service for a family in our fellowship who lost an adult son. Uh, he was a very young man. His body just couldn't sustain the abuse it had suffered. He was a fun-loving guy. A good guy. He had served his country. He was well loved by his friends and his family. And his early death, as you can imagine, sent his family into a season of a pit of life. And you may be saying, Joe, why all the 
encouraging, uplifting stories this morning. Why are you troubling us with this news about your friends? Well, I'm sharing these stories because I know that you too have experienced difficult times in your life. Just because you're human, I can confidently say you've spent some time in the pit too. Kind of been there, done that. And if there was just one thing I came away with as I prepared uh, the teaching for this morning, I felt like God would want you and I to know that we're never alone in the pit. See, my tendency is to believe this. My life has been so much tougher than your life. I mean, in my mind, that's the way I think. That you couldn't possibly have suffered as much pain in your life as I have in my life. But the truth is, each one of us has suffered through something. And that something that you've suffered through is no less intense than what I suffer through. We all go through difficult seasons in life. Jesus warned us of the pits of life. He said, in this world you will have what? Trouble, tribulation. Yeah, we're going to have that stuff. And uh, the old slogan is, Jesus said it, I believe it, that settles it. <laughs> but I don't like that when it applies to this, but that's what it is. We all endure some of life's less desirable seasons, and there are spans of time, the duration of which only the Lord really knows. But here's the encouragement. Sooner or later, those seasons end. Yeah, they come to completion in our life, and we move on to what's next. So the focus of our time in God's Word this morning is not so much concerned with our time in the pit. That's a whole different message. But this message is just the opposite of that. So this message is a message of rescue and hope. It's a message of delivery and restoration after the pit. It's King David's personal testimony to you and I that not only does God have the power to pull us out of the pit, no matter how deep that pit is, but God also has a plan for us to learn something from the pit which will help us grow in some way. God's all about our growth. So if you're in Psalm chapter 40, say, say there's purpose in the pit. Good, great. So we're going to walk through this chapter verse by verse this morning. King David says, starting in verse 1, I waited patiently for the Lord, and he inclined to me and heard my cry. And the first thing I would ask you to notice is how David waited for the Lord. David waited patiently. Yeah. And maybe you've experienced that. Um, here's the thing in my life. God frequently brings me to a place of confession through his word. When I'm reading in his word, sometimes he puts his finger on something in my life and he says, Joe, you need to address this. You need to correct this. Something in my personal walk with the Lord. And so my confession this morning is that I'm just not a very patient person. I'm not. My wife Anna would agree with that. And she would probably share with you that I expect people to show great patience with me. So I have this double standard with regard to patience in my life. When Anna asks me to do something, I want some time to process it. I want to plan how I'm going to respond to her. I want to finish what I'm doing right then, in the moment. Or I want to wait for what I think is the right time. But when I ask something of her, I expect an immediate response. In the affirmative, I want her to agree with me. 
So speaking as a person who has a propensity toward being impatient, let me start by giving you two scriptural facts that will help you to be patient when you're walking through a difficult time. Fact one, you're never alone in the pit. Never alone. See, because you've aligned yourself with Jesus and you have this family around you called the local church, man, you've got people with you wherever you are. Peter, in chapter 5 of his first New Testament letter, said this. He said, be sober, be vigilant, because the adversary, the devil, walks about like a roaring lion. He's seeking whom he may devour. Resist him steadfast in the faith, knowing that the same sufferings are experienced by your brotherhood in all the world. See, in the language of the church, it's called the fellowship of suffering. You've heard of our fellowship, and that's something we press into, something we love. But we also have this fellowship of suffering with Jesus and with each other. But the bottom line is we're not alone in the pit. Because of our faith, our faith in Jesus, it binds us together with others that are suffering just like we are. And I would never minimize the importance of being connected to others in the body of Christ in a substantial way. It's called a body for a reason. We're really connected. But David reminds us there's another in the pit when he says, and he inclined to me. And what that means is the Lord leaned into David. The description is kind of an Old Testament thing. When they would eat, they ate around a lowered table. It wasn't a table like we have. And they would sit on the ground. And inclining meant that they would lean back on one elbow and they would continue to eat. But when you inclined, if you're in a group of people, you typically inclined into somebody else's space. And so that's what happened here. David said, he inclined to me. The Lord leaned into my space. He was right there with me, very close to me during that time. Now, does it, does it provide a certain amount of comfort to know that other people are in the pit with you? I think it does. Yeah, absolutely. But that's not what, where David found his help. David later says, my help comes from the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. That's who David depended on for help. So here's the first thing that I hope you'll take with you concerning this pit. When we find ourselves in the pit, the first thing we need to do is to look for Jesus. Because if we're in the pit, he's in the pit with us. In the Gospel of Matthew, Jesus says, Lo, I am with you always, unless you're in the pit. No, he doesn't say that. He says, Lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. See, Jesus also promised he'd never leave us nor forsake us. Then Paul said it this way in Romans chapter 8, For I am persuaded that neither life nor death nor angels, nor principalities, nor power, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus, our Lord. The love of God comes to us through Christ Jesus. And Jesus says, I'm not going anywhere, even when you're in the pit. So how do we find patience in the pit? Well, first we realize that it's kind of a shared malady among our believing brothers and sisters in the body of Christ. I mean, you've got people in this church that have been in the pit before. No question about it. They may even walk through a time in the pit with you. And second, we find patience in the pit by looking for Jesus in the pit, our Savior. 
And I found this, what you look for, you ultimately find, right? So if you're always looking for your spouse's shortcomings, you, you tend to find those. So here's my encouragement to you. When you're in the pit, look for something positive. Look for Jesus, our Savior, in the pit. He's there with you, and he promises that you'll find him if you'll seek him with all of your heart. That's what he says in his word. He's there, and you can find him. You've just got to look for him. So the first way to find patience in the pit is to realize that you're not in the pit alone. You have other people around you, and the Lord is there too. Your Savior is there with you. And the second fact that helps you to build patience in the pit, in the pit is knowing that there's a way out of the pit. Listen to Paul, the apostle from 1 Corinthians 10. He said, no temptation has overtaken you except such as common to man. But God is faithful who will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able. But with the temptation will also make a way of escape that you may be able to bear it. And then David from Psalm 33 says, Our soul waits for the Lord. He is our help and our shield. For our heart shall rejoice in him because we have trusted in his holy name. Let your mercy, O Lord, be upon us just as we hope in you. See, many times we find ourselves kind of stuck in the pit. But what we can't do Jesus can do. Those things that are impossible for us are possible with Jesus Christ. So we don't lose hope because we're confident that Jesus is our way maker. Jesus is going to make a way out for us. No matter how deep your pit is, remember this, it's never permanent. It's a season. I know that's hard to say when you're there. But the Lord will make a way out for you. And until we find ourselves back on solid ground, our role, I think our purpose, our responsibility is to keep seeking Jesus for the purpose he has for us in the pit. See, because if he didn't want us to accomplish something there, I don't think he would allow us to be there. The Navigator's Jerry Bridges said this. It's one of my favorite quotes. God brings only what is necessary, but he will not shrink back from that which will help us grow. Growth is a good thing in our life. I believe pressing into what God is doing through the pit will grow us in the pit. So here's what we take away from verse 1. When we're in the pit, we wait patiently in the pit. We look for Jesus as he draws near to us in that place. We confidently cry out to him knowing that he has a way out for us in the end. And we press into the pain of the pit, understanding that we're learning lessons through that. And that's God's purpose in the pit. He teaches us things that we wouldn't learn otherwise. That's life in the pit. But let's move out of the pit now, beginning with verse 2. David said, He also brought me out of a horrible pit, out of the miry clay, and he set my feet upon a rock, and he establishes my steps. David uses a pit, literally a hole in the ground, to kind of illustrate and communicate the trials of life. In, in David's day, a, a pit could have been a cistern a collecting area for water. Typically, it was underground, it was dark, it was damp. But the pit also could be like Joseph was thrown into by his brothers for holding purposes. And the floor of these pits could be hard or they could be holding water. It just depends on where they were dug. 
whatever the case, the longer you were there, the worse it got. I mean, you didn't have much in the pit. If you were lucky, somebody would throw something down for you to eat occasionally. So you would eat what you could, and the rest of it became kind of mixed with the mud and the mire at the bottom of the pit. The disposal of waste is always a problem in the pit. That's all I've got to say about that. So the pit gets worse with time. So David, in calling this a horrible pit, would indicate that he had spent a significant amount of time in the pit. And a pit can be a filthy place over time. It can be an unhealthy place for us to hang out. And here's the thing. God sees the place that we're stuck in, no matter how filthy or how unhealthy it may be. He knows when we're dead in our sins, even if we don't. He wrote the book on freedom, and he loves to set his captives free. See, David's experienced perspective is this. He also brought me up out of a horrible pit, out of the miry clay, and he set my feet up on a rock, and he established my steps. That's our hope when we're in the pit. Salvation, deliverance, freedom. See, if God saved David from the pit, he'll save us from the pit too. His faithful love endures forever. God's in love with us. Sometimes it's hard for us to really grasp that concept. He is in love with you today. Why wouldn't he rescue you out of the pit? So David is pulled out of the pit. His feet are set upon solid ground, probably for the first time in a long time. And God establishes his steps. So the purpose begins to come clear to David, and God immediately puts that purpose to work by ordering his steps. And that's what he does in our life. He begins to order our steps when we come up out of the pit. He gives us his direction in life. In Psalm 37, David said, The steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord, and he delights in his ways. See, God's purpose, the plans that he's working out for our lives, are often waiting for us just outside the pit. He kind of sets our feet in motion as we come out of the pit, as he drags us out of that place, and he begins to accomplish the good works that he has for us to do. We've got to be looking for those things. But it doesn't end there. Back to chapter 40, verse 3, David says, He's put a new song in my mouth. Praise to our God. Many will see it in fear and will trust in the Lord. Blessed is the man who makes the Lord his trust and does not respect the proud, nor such as turn aside to lies. Many, O Lord my God, are your wondrous works which you have done, and your thoughts toward us cannot be recounted to you in order. If I would declare to speak of them... There are more than can be numbered. So the next thing, outside of the pit, he puts a new song in our hearts. And I would say this, when God puts a new song in your heart, sing it. Man. Yeah, I, I began working on this message several months ago, and it was when Windshape was on our campus. And... Uh, Man, that's a happening time in the life of our church. My role is to kind of help out with the traffic flow and, and to connect with the parents as they're dropping off the kids in the morning. And it's wind shape, you know, so the music is thumping. If you've been here, you know what that means. The kids, they're dancing when they get out of the car. They're ready to go. It's another day. Uh, I look like I'm dancing, but I'm just trying to direct traffic and keep from getting hit. 
But when the drop-off is just finishing up on one of those days, this lovely new version of an old hymn, I Surrender All, came on the music mix. Some of you know that. And some of you know this about me. Southern Baptist goes back for generations in my family. So if there's one thing I know, it's hymns. So I'm out in the front parking lot, and I'm immediately engaged in this hymn. All to Jesus I surrender. All to him I freely give. I will ever love and trust him in his presence daily live. I surrender all. I surrender all. All to Jesus I surrender. I surrender all. Man. At that moment, God put a new song in my heart, and I couldn't help but sing it. It just resonated with me. And we've all been in the pit before. I mean, some of you may share a propensity toward the melancholy in life. And I, that means that you go through seasons of depression. Uh, pastor Louis Giglio, the pastor of Passion Church in Atlanta, says, Worship is without question the most effective antidepressant there is. Man, we find ourselves worshiping the Lord. It's just hard to be depressed. And Louis knows that of which he speaks. So when God puts that new song in your heart, sing it out, sing it loud. You're out of the pit, so worship the Lord for showing you his faithfulness once again. And listen, this specific hymn, I Surrender All, it had great significance to me at that particular time because it's the next thing that God is calling us to do through the words of David in our text this morning. We surrender. We surrender every aspect of our life to Jesus. Join me there in verse 6, if you will. Sacrifice an offering you did not desire. My ears you have opened. David's saying, I understand it now. You, you really don't want those offerings and, and those sacrifices. Burn offering and sin offering you did not require. Then I said, behold, I come. In the scroll of the book it is written of me, I delight to do your will, O oh my God, and your law is written within my heart. Now, it's important for us to understand at the time of this particular writing, David's words recorded here for us, it would have been blasphemous to say what he said. See, this was a time before Jesus when the Old Testament sacrificial system was followed to the letter. It was all about sacrifices and offering. A blood sacrifice was required for the remission of sin. There was blood all over the place. But David takes us beyond the system of sacrifice to a time when our sins are once and for all atoned for by the sacred blood of Jesus Christ. See, David fast forwards to our time when sacrifices aren't a thing anymore, a time when God desires of us not sacrifice, but surrender to him. A time when we set aside our will and we delight to do his will. Why do we do that? Well, David says because his law is written on our hearts. Because we know that's what he, what he wants. And this surrender is the foundation of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Now, for some of us, coming out of the pit means that we surrender to Jesus for the first time in our lives. We may not have ever come to that place before. It may have been a time for you like it was for me. I mean, I'd tried everything else, and I told the Lord specifically, I can't do this on my own anymore. I can't do it. I can't live this life. And in his kindness, God responded to me. God, as he, he very often is, was moved with compassion by a very real, very sincere cry for help. 
Or it may be a time like it was for a friend of mine. I mean, this guy had been in a relationship with the Lord, no question about that. But when God pulled him out of the most recent pit that he was in, God was calling him to a deeper level of commitment, a a deeper level of surrender. And God does that. I mean, God did that again in my life when I thought the working out of my salvation was done. I thought I kind of arrived at that point. And what I found out was that I'm still working it out every day, day by day. And regardless of the situation, Romans 10, 9 applies. If you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. You'll be saved. And I don't think Paul minimizes the gospel message by saying it that way. I believe what he was doing was he was speaking to slow learners like me. He wanted to make sure they understood what he was saying. Hey, you can be saved. It's not that difficult. Now, there's still going to be some working out. You know, you're still going to work through things, trust me. But you can be saved today. And listen, you may be here this morning, and the Lord is asking you to surrender Maybe the first time, maybe the tenth time. And I would say if he's doing that, you're not wondering if it's you. You know it's you. He's dealing with your heart today. He's saying, hey, surrender to me again. We'll have some prayer teams available after the services this morning. We always do for that purpose. You can come up, receive prayer. You can come up, you can surrender your life to the Lord. And I can tell you, there's nothing these guys would rather do than pray with you a prayer of surrender to the Lord today. So we're all the way up to verse 9. Man, we're making progress. David says, I proclaim the good news of righteousness in the great assembly. Indeed, I do not restrain my lips. O Lord, you yourself know. I have not hidden your righteousness within my heart. I have declared your faithfulness and your salvation. I have not concealed your loving kindness and your truth from the great assembly. So the next step that David takes after he is pulled up out of this pit is that he shares with what God has done for him. Not only removing him from the pit, I think, but what he's done while he was in the pit. Because God changed David there, just like he changes us. And even before the time of Christ, David called it the good news of righteous living. I love that. See, through trials, God had brought David to a place where he was willing to live rightly. He wanted to live rightly. And David was intentional about sharing that with all the people that were around him. Now, I want you to notice three things that David did in that. First, he shared with the great assembly. Now, these were the people that God had surrounded David with. These were David's guys. He kind of placed these guys into David's hands. David had already been given influence over them and authority in their lives. And I would say God has done the same with you and I. God has brought people into our lives. He's connected us with some in a very significant way. And I think his desire is that we share this gospel of right living with them. And you don't have to be an evangelist to be able to do that. I mean, they're already in our sphere of influence, so all we have to do is follow Peter's instructions when he said, always be ready to give a defense to everyone who asks the reason for the hope that is in you. And when they ask, we need to be ready to answer. God gives us all relationships. He connects to you, connects you to, to people very different than he will connect me with. 
regardless of who they are, we just need to be good stewards of those relationships. That's all God expects. Just be a good steward. Number two, also notice David was accountable to the Lord. David said, Lord, you yourself know. And it's been said, with great authority comes great responsibility. I think David understood that he had a responsibility with all that he had been given and that God was watching him. God was the person to hold him accountable. And third, David puts his faith into action. James would love that, faith in action. He's not hiding his faith or the attributes of God. He's publicly speaking about those things. And there are an endless number of resources that you can draw from to share the truth about Jesus Christ with another person. But the first step is this, just share what you already know. Tell people what Jesus did in your life. Tell him who you were before, how he changed that, who you are after. Very simple way to share your testimony. And here's the thing, it's your personal story. It's real, it'll be easy for you to share, and no one can refute it. Be ready to share the life-changing truth about Jesus. And don't miss the context of that. You share this good news in meekness and in fear. You don't thump them over the head with the Bible. You know, you don't yell at them on a street corner somewhere. You share it in meekness and in fear. And if you're not ready to share the truth of Jesus Christ in meekness and in fear, then I would say you're probably not ready to share it. We need to share it in the right way so it'll be received. Paul, in the first chapter of the book of Romans, said, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God to salvation for everyone who believes. Church, we don't have to save them. Man, our service to God is just to give them Jesus. We give them Jesus, God will take care of the rest. That's, that's the power of God to save all who believe, his word says. We do the sharing and God does the saving. So verse 11, and I'm going to read through to the end of the chapter here just to, to finish up this section of Scripture. David says in verse 11, Do not withhold your tender mercies from me, O Lord. Let your loving kindness and your truth continually preserve me, for innumerable evils have surrounded me. Wait a minute. What's happening here? David just got out of a pit. Doesn't sound like that. Let your... Loving kindness and your truth continually preserve me, for innumerable evils have surrounded me. My iniquities have overtaken me so that I'm not able to look up. They are more than the hairs of my head. Therefore, my heart fails me. Verse 13, be pleased, O Lord, to deliver me. O Lord, make haste to help me. Let them be ashamed and brought to mutual confusion who seek to destroy my life. Let them be driven backward and brought to dishonor who wish me evil. Let them be confounded because of their shame who say to me, Aha! Let all who seek you rejoice and be glad in you. Let such as love your salvation say continually, the Lord be magnified. But I am poor and needy, yet the Lord thinks upon me. You are my help and my deliverer. Do not delay, O oh my God. You know, I would have loved to have stopped with verse 10. <laughs> but God wouldn't let me. And what David is describing in these last verses is another season of suffering. No doubt it's the right thing to do because it's true. See, when you get to be my age, you've learned that there's always another season of suffering. There just is. 
there always seems to be another pit. Calvary Chapel pastor and teacher John Corson said it like this, in the Christian life, we're either plowing or we're proclaiming. Now, I grew up spending summers on a dairy farm in central Mississippi. I see Leo Gray here this morning. He's seen that farm. My grandfather, Roscoe Terrell Ferguson, was a herdsman for a dairy farm. My mother gave me the name Terrell after my grandfather. I think I would have preferred Roscoe. <laughs> But he and my grandmother, Rosalie Case, they were subsistence farmers, and that meant that their work was never done. So when Terrell was finished with his work at the dairy, he'd come home to work in a massive vegetable garden that they would use to can vegetables to get them through the winter. And that's where I got the experience of plowing firsthand from watching my grandfather. And here's what this plowing kind of looks like in the Christian life. Uh, first thing's important to know, you're the plow, okay? You're the tip of the spear. Your time in the field is spent being jerked around, for the most part, below ground, you're moving headlong through the hard, solid soil of the earth and everything that resides in it. That's what you do as a plow. That includes rocks. They hurt when you go through them. Tree roots, they wrap around you. They kind of slow things down. And anything else that was buried there since time began, your job as a plow is to get through that. And here's the best scenario, if you call it that. All you see is dirt. You see dirt in front of you. That's where you're going. You've got two huge piles of dirt on each side of you. That's where you've already been. That's plowing. Fun stuff, right? But then there's the proclaiming of the Christian life. Now, this proclaiming comes at the end of each furrow or each row, and it's a, a really brief time of celebration above ground. Aren't really any cheers or accolades waiting for you there. Mostly, it's just a repositioning that you make, and then you're drug back below the ground again for another challenging time of plowing. The obstacles are never announced. They just hit you in the face. And that's the plowing and proclaiming of the Christian life. I think that's what John Corson was trying to describe for his audience. But there's some good news even in the plowing with Jesus. Two things about the plowing season as we're kind of quickly drawing to a close this morning. These are important. First of all, God is working in your life through the plowing. Many of you can look back and see that. Now, I'm thankful for that, that I can. I look back at those times when I was in the pit, and I see God working so strongly, so quickly, so significantly in my life. There's purpose in every pit. James reminds us in his writings, he says, count it all joy when you fall into various trials, knowing this, that the testing of your faith produces patience. But let patience have its perfect work, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking nothing. See, that's where we're going as Christians. We're not there yet, but one day, I'm absolutely confident of this, one day, I'm going to be perfect and complete, lacking nothing. And so are you. Passive Christians don't get persecuted. For you and I, producing fruit is an issue with the enemy of her soul. He doesn't like that. Christian motivational speaker Zig Ziglar once said, if you haven't run into the devil today, it's probably because you're walking in the same direction he is. See, opposition can mean, and I believe it very often 
does mean that we're doing something right. We're making progress. We're moving in a really good direction. And number two, as we've already discussed this morning, when you're suffering, you're not suffering alone. God is there with you. In Joshua 1, after Joshua assumes Moses' position of leadership with the children of Israel, the Lord says to Joshua, every place that the sole of your foot will tread upon, I have given to you. As I said to Moses, from the wilderness and this Lebanon as far as the great river, the river Euphrates, all the land of the Hittites, and to the great sea toward the going down of the sun shall be your territory. So the territory that you're plowing through as a believer, as a follower of Jesus Christ, I believe God is giving you. He's giving it to you. God said every place that you step, to me that means we ought to step everywhere. <laughs> Take it all in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Man, you're plowing through it, so subdue it in the power and the authority of our Savior, Jesus Christ. Not in your power, not in your authority. You don't have any. You're just like me. Do it in His authority. So a quick summary. We all experience pits. I think we'd agree with that. Wait patiently when you're in the pit. You've got a family around you in the local church. Press into those relationships for encouragement and support. Man, if you're doing life alone, I've been there. You're doing it all wrong. That's not the way God designed you to function. Surround yourself with godly people, like-minded people, because you're going to need them at some point. And when you're in the pit, you look for Jesus in the pit because he is there with you. That's what his word says. And then when God, once God pulls you out of the pit, make it your goal to make progress away from the pit. Man, get out of that area. First, by letting the Lord order your steps. I think he'll do that if you ask him to. Submit to his authority and his plan, and in military terminology, get off the X. Now, I have a friend that's a, a great soldier. He's been a soldier for a long time, and he says, the X is that place as a soldier that you never want to be on. So, man, when you find yourself in that place you get as far away from it as quickly as you can. Get off the X. Do anything you can to get away from that place. Next, sing a new song. I believe a natural part of the recovery process in coming out of our pits is God placing a song of thanksgiving in our hearts. Man, when we come out of the pit, we're thankful. Now, we may not be thankful for the pit yet, but we're thankful to be out of it. Later, we'll be thankful for it. God puts a new song of thanksgiving in your heart, and your response is just to sing it. Man, sing that song. Worship the Lord for his faithfulness. So we wait patiently for the Lord. We let the Lord order our steps. We sing that new song, and fourth and last, we surrender every aspect of our life to Jesus. And you may say, Joe, I've already done that. My response would be, do it again, and then do it again. You know, it, it's we die daily. Don't leave anything out. Surrender in every aspect of your life. That's the context of this. That means I get up in the morning, I surrender everything to him. And I get up tomorrow morning and I do it all over again. I surrender everything to him again. And I do it again and again and again. And I come to a deeper level of surrender by doing that on a daily basis. God meets me there. He honors that. And then when you're out of the pit, 
you're getting away from it, share what God has done. Share what God has done. God has pulled you out of a pit. He's given you your life back. So tell somebody about it. Be prepared to give a reason for the hope that you have in you. I shared a walk through a difficult season of life with a friend a few years ago. And I have to tell you, it was the longest season of difficulty I've been through. It was hard. And when I came out of it, man, I was elated. And I can't even tell you how happy I was. So I walked into this guy's place of business, and the first thing I said to him was, David, I got my life back. He didn't say a word. Got that deer in the headlights look, and he said, Man, Joe, I didn't know you and Anna were having any problems. I said, no, I got my life back, not my wife back. So here's the deal. When you get your wife, I mean, when you get your life back, share it with somebody. Man, tell somebody about it. It's edifying to you. It's encouraging to them. It's a good thing. When, when we have people respond to the gospel of Jesus Christ, we take them back in the prayer room, and I kind of walk them through some next steps, try to give them some practical advice. Hey, what do you do next? You made this huge decision in your life. The, the big question that comes out of that is, what do I do now? And so we try to give them some next steps. One of those next steps is tell somebody about the decision that you made. Tell somebody about it. Somebody's been praying for you. Probably wouldn't be here if they hadn't been. So take advantage of that. It's a win-win. And listen, if, if your friends don't know about the gospel message, man, step out in faith. Tell them what God has done in your life. If you're, if you're structure-oriented and you've got to have a specific way to do that, man, research it. They're all over the place. Call me. I'll give you a few of them. They're not difficult. But there's no greater privilege than to lead someone to a personal faith in Jesus Christ because Jesus came to seek and save the lost. That's what he did. So you're you're somehow helping in that. God gives us that privilege. And finally... Get ready, because there's always another season of plowing coming. But the cool thing is, when you go through that, in in the words of James, you're, you're getting closer and closer to being perfect and complete and lacking nothing. Man, you don't you don't go back to the beginning and start over again. You're more prepared each time a trial comes, and you'll find you approach them very differently and very confidently in Jesus Christ, if that's who you're relying on for your strength and your salvation. Part of our life on earth is going through difficult times. It's a learning process for us. But this earth is not our home. There's a time coming, I believe it's coming very soon, when our lives here on earth will be done and we'll spend the rest of all eternity with our Savior in a place called the paradise of God in heaven. And I look forward to seeing you guys there. It's going to be a good day.